All right. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to um, this next episode of Culture Eats Everything, as we always are talking to CEOs about life, but have a very interesting CEO and founder and entrepreneur for you to meet today. Uh, so I wanted to introduce you uh, to Shella, who I am always afraid. She told me it rhymes with Stella and it still scares me, but Shella Rooney. Uh, yeah. Tell, tell us a bit more about you. Well, my name is Shella Rooney. Um, I am a, a physical therapist by trade. Um, I am a board certified specialist in geriatric physical therapy. I've been doing it for 26 years. Um, I get to speak internationally about knee replacement recovery, and that's led me to my current role, which, as you said, is a CEO um, and owner of Go Knee LLC. Um, and fun fact, I was born in England and raised in Canada and now living in Hookville, Tennessee, which is smack dab between Knoxville and Nashville with my uh, husband and three kids. Wow. And so, yeah, you've been in the PT world for a long time. How long have you been married? How old are the kids? Tell us about. I've um, been married 24 years. I nice. um, got a 21 year old who's going to be a senior next year. Got a almost 20 year old son who's joining the army effective last week and i got an almost 14 year old who is going on 30 and um, is parenting herself <laughs> well and so um well talk a little bit about um goni and i when you said cooksville tennessee thought of the crossfit world and so t talk about goni how'd you get into it um you know well yeah. um i i I don't think it's a typical story. Like I did not grow up thinking I want to be a business owner and I want to own a product business and I just want to, you know, be in business for myself. Never crossed my mind. I chose uh, PT. I wanted to help people. I was an athlete growing up. And so it made sense in healthcare. Hmm, I want to be a physical therapist. Um, so I did that, but um, it just happened to be a few years ago, had a patient who was struggling um, after knee replacement surgery and I'm a problem solver. It's who I am in every aspect of my life. And he just, he was a, a great guy. He was active, he was healthy, motivated. He was compliant, all the things that not all my patients are, um, but his recovery just wasn't going well. And he had gone to a follow-up appointment with his surgeon and his surgeon said, I don't like how your knee is moving. It's not moving enough. You need to do something. Um, if you don't, well, you know, a couple months, we're gonna schedule you for another surgery. So um, as you can imagine, he was not too happy. He was actually quite uh, uh, not only disappointed, but frustrated and aggravated and irritated and, you know, just all these things. And he actually was speaking to one of my um, business partners at the time. She was a physical therapist. And he just said, you know, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I do everything. I'm following the rules. I do everything I'm supposed to. You know, I don't want another surgery. Clearly, you know, give me something to do. And we were just frustrated. We had you know, done all the bags of tricks that we knew. Well, she's very creative and she just went to a local hardware store that weekend and built something and um we gave it to him and uh fast forward he did not need another surgery he had a great recovery and lo and behold um you know what do they say ne uh, necessity is the mother of invention you know mm -hmm. bony was born now i would like to elaborate um, i'd love to say that we just were so business savvy that we were like oh my gosh this is a fantastic business but we did not, you know, in typical healthcare professional, um, you know, we shelved it. We put it in a closet in the therapy gym and it sat there for months. So in our, I think that's the difference between uh, entrepreneurs. They're constantly thinking of business ideas. Whereas in the therapy realm, we're constantly thinking of how we can help our patients, which I, I think are different. So really the device didn't come back out of the closet until we had our next patient that was struggling after knee replacement you know she had i mean similar but not similar struggles and we were like hmm i wonder if that device could help her and again lo and behold it helped her and then the light bulbs went off and we were like maybe we have something special maybe we should do something and that's when you know we reached out to some free resources talked to some small business you know entrepreneur centers and you know formed an llc and you know started a patent process started clinical research 
um, all the things that business owners know to do. You know, we figured it out, websites, um, business partnerships, but that's kind of how it started. I'd love to say it was just like, oh, I saw a need and I filled it, but no, it was just a reaction to a problem that a patient was having. Well, I mean, I think that makes a ton of sense. Like, and it makes me wonder how many other really great products and businesses might just be sitting on shelves in some PT clinics all around us all the time. Or I think more than you can imagine. All <laughs> therapists are creative. They're always trying to come up with a solution for the problem that that patient has in front of them. But we just, I mean, now I'm, I think broadly, but at the time you're, it's not that we're narrow-minded. We're just so focused on that one patient and making sure he meets his goals and he reaches what he's supposed to, that you come up with creative ideas, but you don't think about patenting and a business. Like, again, some therapists are very business minded. Um, I tended to work with geriatrics in like home health and nursing homes and rehab facilities, just a different mindset um, versus like outpatient yeah. clinics and stuff like that. But so I don't want to speak for other therapists who are very business minded. I just wasn't. And I wasn't around people that were very business savvy. We were just very patient focused. Yeah. And what led you to that being patient focused, the geriatric and home? Like what, what is it? What drew you to that? You know, um, I said I wanted to, I was an athlete and that I wanted to help people. So I wanted to, you know, be a physical therapist to, to do sports medicine and no disrespect to anybody who does sports medicine or, you know, athletes and coaches every day deal with them. But I did it for a year out of school and then realized I don't really like athletes and I don't really love coaches or the parents of the athletes because, you know, I don't get to dictate their recovery. And, you know, not that I have control issues, but I feel like I'm the leader and the expert in this field. And, you know, the determination to play in the game on Friday should be based on my clinical knowledge and skills, not on let's give them a shot and put them in and we'll figure it out later. So I struggled with the, um, I don't want to call it uh, perverse incentives, but I, I didn't realize that that was going to be a huge component in sports medicine. So I decided to ix that and there was an opening at a nursing home. Next thing you know, I'm in a nursing home and I'm seeing people, you know, definitely over the age of 70 up to 90, 100, whatever. And I realized, oh my goodness, this is my jam. And I mean, you fast forward 25 years and all I have done is specialize in the now they call it the older adult. It's not geriatrics anymore. It's uh, which I'm almost I'm almost in the older adult category. I mean, it's like 50 and above with any kind of chronic medical condition. But that's it, it. Just I'll be honest. I think it challenges me the most. Treating you, you know, with an ankle fracture is one thing. It might be difficult, but treating a patient with dementia who had a fall, who fractured her ankle, and doesn't know not to put weight on her leg. Now that's challenging. You know, so, or you add on, she has a catheter that she forgets to take with her, or she's on medication that causes dizziness. I mean, right. to me, it took my whole facet of knowledge to treat an elder patient compared to, you know, an, an 18 year old that has one problem because they're healthy versus the older adult who has multiple problems and you can't just treat one. I love that yeah. dynamic. Well, so talk a little bit about one of the interesting things in your story is that you you started becoming the entrepreneur who who realized you have this product. You launched the business at what, in hindsight, pretty bad timing. So what what got you to that moment of making the jump? And then, you know, when you look back in hindsight, what what has that taught you? <laughs> it teaches me to anticipate a global pandemic. And if I can anticipate that, I could have done things differently. Sure. No, I mean, it wasn't that we intentionally, I mean, we started the business, we, we really launched Goni in January of 2020, meaning, and I say that because I actually quit a job that I loved. So meaning I stopped doing day-to-day -day, uh, physical therapy, which I loved. I, uh, you know, it's been a passion of mine. It fills my cup every day. I made that jump in January, 2020, because we had had two years of clinical research preceding that. So we were kind of waiting. The patent process was well underway. It's just a time and pay money and wait game. Um, but the research had come out in like November and December of 2019, and it was better than what we could have imagined. So we knew we were getting good results, but in the healthcare world, that's called anecdotal evidence, which means my opinion says, but there's no you know numbers or facts to back it up. So we wanted independent research and we did it through Belmont University here in Nashville. And so it took them two years, their doctorate program of, of PTs did that. And so it was released in 2019. And I mean, the, the, the research was so compelling on how quickly patients using GoNe were getting better compared to traditional therapy. But at that point, all I could picture was like, 
the Shark Tank panel of Mark Cuban saying, why have you not quit your job if you believe in this product? And so, you know, at the time, there was three of us therapists that were that were doing this. So I took the leap of faith, quit the day job jump in and let's let's do this in January of 2020 you know um and I was very I mean when I say I hit the floor running I was very successful those first few months of finding salespeople all across the U.S. training them sending demos um I mean I was on it and then March 2020 hits and it's like I'm sorry we are suspending knee replacement surgeries First of all, number two, we're not doing any in-person marketing or demonstrations. So it's really hard to launch a knee product without a demonstration, hands-on, and an in-person face-to-face with surgeons and therapists. So it was quite, I mean, I, I'm going to use the word devastating, but if I could think of a more profound word, that would apply here. I mean, I was devastated. Yeah. Well, and so I, I think any person who launches a business, any person who even just makes like a compared to yours nominal career shift like it there's lots of fear involved so yeah what how did you get past that how did you handle um I, I i wish i could give you my dream answer which is oh i quickly pivoted and realized that these individuals who had their surgeries canceled still have knee pain and my product and my program helps with knee pain even before the surgery so a business-minded individual who, you know, would have been like, this is fantastic. I mean, let's make, you know, lemonade out of lemons and let's market to these people waiting for this surgery with so much uncertainty and these people needing to go to therapy that couldn't go because of the fear. You know, I wish I could say that, oh, I just pivoted quickly, started targeting them and sales skyrocketed and, you know, the rest is history. But no, 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 I wallowed and I threw myself lots of pity parties and um you know second guessed everything and um and i'd like to say i only did that for a few months but it was longer than that it was it was long i was kind of like like i mean like the rest of the world you know this this pandemic this covid is going to stop and it'll be fine i'll resume plan a because plan a was so good but um i just was really really slow to pivot and i mean my initial marketing plan was to go after surgeons and health professionals and so i just i didn't have a plan b which mistake number one, um, you know, it took me almost a year to realize, oh, I need to change my website and my marketing materials and my pitch. And I need to go after the consumer because I can actually access them through social media or, you know, Google or through online stuff. And so it took me a long time to pivot. And I'll tell you that during that time, it was very stressful on the business partners and I, because, you know, we had a plan. Um, and I, I, for anybody who's listening, who's not like, who's new to this uh, business journey, especially if you're a product, like I, we were naive in thinking that we have a product. It worked so well. I mean, the research just shows how well it works. I mean, we're going to take the 1 million Americans that are going to have the surgery next year. We're going to multiply it by the cost of our device. And we're going to make zillions of dollars immediately. So you know, postponing the plan for a year seemed no big deal because the zillions of dollars were still going to be made. You know, little did we know that there's something called a, you know, a product life cycle and that, you know, the people that were buying initially were friends and people that knew us or, you know, one degree of separation or, you know, uh, it, we were just so naive. So with all that said, my business partners weren't, um, they weren't comfortable with the financial investment we were making and not having a return because of COVID and the inability to generate revenue. Um, so in like 2021, near the end, they decided to exit. And that was another devastation uh, for me. It was, a, 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 again, another time for me to wallow and throw another pity party, which has been my business journey. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty tragic. Yeah, but if the story ended there, then I mean, yes. But I, I would think um, that we we could sit down with lots of other entrepreneurs who have launched things, and they've all the pandemic is unique. But 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 they would feel the same thing about being naive, about not having a plan B, about it just being stressful and fear. And so, but the point is, you're still here. So it's you've you survived. It's 2023. The pandemic. I guess I don't know where it is, but like, so talk about where are you at now? Like, what have you learned through that uh, difficult process? And um, I, well, what I learned and like 
to, to give a shout out to my the, the business partners that helped start it out. One of them was the, the actual person who created the idea of the device. The thing was, I was the only one that quit my day job. So they're still working as physical therapists every day. So they're continuing to improve their physical therapy skills. Whereas all I'm doing is reading and digesting and talking to everything business, entrepreneur, small business, product business, online stuff. So, you know, um, I believe it was you that gave me this, you know, jokingly honorary business degree, but you know, that's what I felt like I was on a path for learning and growth. You know, let's learn about finances. Let's learn about business strategies. Let's learn about, you know, QuickBooks. Let's learn about marketing. Let's learn about SEO. All these terms that don't come across the physical therapist desk. We don't have to sit there and figure out, you know, search engine optimization, patients can find us, like it's not that hard. So um, while I they were doing their day job and just supporting me on the side, I was doing this growth thing. So I feel like by the time they realized that we just can't be vested, I was so vested because I had done the work. I had talked to so many people, you know, I, 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 again, I learned the mom test. Like I finally realized I need to talk to people that are going to actually give me an honest opinion about my, my business and, you know, the likelihood of success. So I just feel like it's not fair for them. They just didn't see the financial investment as being worth it. Whereas I was like full throttle all in. Do I need to sell a kid? Like, what do I need to do to keep going? Because I was bought in at that point. And so, you know, you're right. I'm here now. Uh, made lots of mistakes, but once I, that pivot happened in my head, once they exited, and um, again, I had a pity party because I had that imposter syndrome, which is a new term I learned. You know, I was like, I can't do this by myself. Like the credibility was with a team of therapists that created this device and this protocol. And you know, how is it that? And I didn't know the word solopreneur, but in my head, I was like, three people could be a business, but one person, what is that? Like, that's just a hobby, you know? And so I struggled with that for a long time. Um, but once I finally got over that, um, I mean, it has been, do not look back. Like, you know, you fall, you get back up, you pivot, you keep going. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, yeah, if you would talk to me about a year and a half ago, I'd be like, being a business owner stinks. There's nothing great about it. You just feel bad every day. You have people that say no to your face and, you know, um, you're just, it's just a constant uh, hustle. But yeah. um, now I've learned to see those hustles as, you know, opportunities. Yeah. Well, so it's, it's interesting. There's, um, I forget, some smart person at some point said this, we can just quote them, but uh, it was, you know, that success is just getting up one more time than you fell down. And we all wish we all over, I mean, your story, like for the business is very condensed, but I think we all do this with our careers, our lives, like we grossly overestimate what we can do in the short term. Uh, or no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Grossly overestimate what we'll do in the short term. And then really, really underestimate in the long term and the consistency and the like Jim Collins flywheel, just like sticking with something. Um, and imposter syndrome is real and, and it actually is also good. So it can be bad and debilitating a, a better way for the good version of it is rookie smarts. Like you put yourself in a place to be a rookie. And when you're a rookie, you know, to ask questions, you know, you don't know it all, you know, you need coaches and mentors and help, and that's what makes you successful. And so I think, um, I mean, hopefully anybody listening to this feels like an imposter and at least one area of their life because they don't have it all figured out and they have challenges. If not, you need to find some, but wherever you have it, like think, thinking like a rookie, I find um, it just helps. Cause I, I think until you're around enough leaders and organizations, you realize like everyone's kind of making this up and we're all sort of unsure of exactly what to do, but we're going to make a decision that's leadership and we're going to stick with it. And when we find it's wrong, we'll pivot and you'll grow. So what would you like when you look back at the, your career in PT switch to being a solopreneur. Um, what, what do you feel like is the biggest lesson that it's taught you about yourself? Um, that I'm resilient and, uh, that I'm tenacious. Um, I just feel like, you know, even my circle of family, you know, like my dad probably a year ago was like, when are you going to get a job? You know? And I'm like, I'm a CEO, you know, come on, I'm a CEO, dad, you know, but I mean, I, I don't even say those words to my dad because it's the biggest imposter syndrome to say to my dad, because his vision of what a CEO is, I am clearly not. But um, I just, uh, I, I was going on a tangent. What was your specific question? How do I, what? 
Well, yeah. What, what would you say? I mean, you, you said resilience, so that's something it showed you. Oh, about. yes, yes. Um, I would What's say that, you? you know what, um, and, and that also, I was like that as a physical therapist, you know, uh, I, if a patient showed up and I couldn't figure them out or I couldn't figure out the diagnosis, like it wasn't like, ah, you're done, I'm discharging you. Like I was never that therapist. I was always, I'm going to call the surgeon, risk being berated by him for asking a stupid question. Like it didn't bother me to ask the difficult questions to figure out the answer so that I could be an advocate for my patient. And I feel like 26 years of that has led me to here where, you know, once I realized that everybody kind of has, like you said, it took me a while to realize that imposter syndrome was rampant. I did not know that above business owners. I thought everybody that's a CEO means they're an expert in finances and business operate. Like, I just thought they all did that, but they don't. And once I realized that it was like, okay, you know, Shella, you've had a growth mindset, you know, in this uh, eagerness for learning your entire career, you're just gonna pivot that and instead of learning maybe hands-on manual techniques, you're now going to learn about business. You're going to learn about marketing. You're going to learn about customers. You're going to learn about manufacturing. And um, so I finally see the joy in that shifting of, oh my goodness, I learn every day. I'm growing every day. I am challenged every day. I mean, I am uncomfortable like nobody's business every day, but in a good way. But it took me a long time and people that I care about um, well, some of the people that I care about, I need to filter out their noise, but some of them that told me you have the, um, they used all the nice adjectives, like, you know, you are resilient, you are intelligent, you are hardworking, you are driven. And so it was like, oh, okay, well, those are the characteristics of an entrepreneur. You know, those are the characteristics of a solopreneur. I'm like, I got those, like I'm ahead of the game. All right, let's just figure out how Absolutely. to apply them in a different way. A different setting but you mentioned back there a few minutes ago about the imposter syndrome i didn't have it in front of people that were supposed to help me so in front of a mentor or a coach or a, an entrepreneur center i didn't ever think i needed to be anything other than i was my imposter syndrome occurred when i was in front of a prospective client you know someone who wanted to hear about my business um that or you know someone's like hey give me your quick pitch like at a networking event that's when it creeped up and you're like, I don't even want to say the word CEO. I don't even want to say the word inventor. I don't want to, because I didn't associate that I was those things. Like, I'm not really the inventor. My business partner, you know, who's now left the business technically created it. But then again, I had really mm. key people that reminded me that an idea does not equal a successful business. You know, um, the product in itself was not the business. It's what I've been doing every day for the last few years that's created the business and so i had to let go of that but i didn't actually develop the original product or i didn't you know i'm now over that and realizing that i've taken it you know taken it farther than it it would have been in a shelf it still would have been in a closet right now so yeah. um exactly yeah that's awesome well and you know one of the things that i would add is because i not when you don't just think about imposter syndrome through the lens of business it's it's far more rampant than than we often realize or give credit or maybe it's even just more subtle and insidious but it every human just has this critic that in moments when someone asks for the pitch or you know you're at a grad party and someone asks you what your job is and there's just this moment of where you reference the college you went to like there's these moments where it's, we just have this critic that is going to assume someone's going to judge us or assume our experience and who we are isn't good enough and it just shows up all the time. And it's a powerful thing to start. And, and thankfully, in your story, you had people around you mirroring to you a different version of yourself that you could choose to see and step into and be resilient and yes. be smart and solve problems. And you'll you'll figure the rest out. So and, and that would be one of my biggest takeaways is surround yourself by people that are not yes people, but that are going to challenge you, but that are your biggest cheerleaders. And I had a patient. That, uh, that I had kept in contact with for over a decade. And when he found out about Goni, you know, he reached out to me and we hadn't spoken in like four or five years. And now he is my biggest and closest business mentor. But, you know, he's got the Harvard business degree to back up when he challenges me versus, you know, say my sister who's 10 years younger is like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm sorry. That's fantastic. But, you know, I've learned to just every opinion is not a valid opinion which, you know, originally you're like, every opinion is important because they know more than I do. You know, it's, it's really helped me to filter the noise and take it with a grain of salt and dismiss what doesn't work for you, you know, and believe in what you're doing. And um, he really helped me recognize that I had the traits 
that were required. It's not a degree that makes you a successful business owner, or, you know, it's not just the product. It's not like there's all these traits and he's really helped me over the last few years figure out I have the traits and the tools to be able to do this, whether I choose to do it, you know, Excellent. so. Yeah. Well, so one of the things before, just because we're, we're going to start winding down time here, and I feel like we could talk a ton about a bunch of other things too. But um, before I ask you um, the last question about your book recommendation for everyone, you know, if you rewound 20 years ago and asked you what you felt like your sense of purpose was in life, it probably would have been through the lens of a physical therapist, patient by patient, solving problems like, you know, some like whatever way you would have articulated would have fell there. And I think this is true for all of us. Whatever we answer today is probably not as big as it should be because we just don't know where we'll be in 10 years. But you believe in what you're doing. You've been, you've been through the trenches in the last couple of years. You're continuing to lead and learn. Um, how would you articulate your, your, your sense of purpose? What is it that you're achieving? Because it's not GONI. It's bigger than that. What is it? Um, well, I would say that even 20 years ago, my purpose was I wanted to help people and trying to figure out how I was going to help. I am just a natural born wanting to help. Um, I'm also, I've learned over the time that I'm also a teacher and an educator. I love to impart wisdom. And I, I, I did that in my PT career as well, imparting patients how to you know, teach a man how to fish kind of thing. Um, I didn't want them relying on me. So, but today, I mean, GONI is a purpose for me. Like it, I, I am going to revolutionize knee replacement industry, not just in the US, you know, I'm saying my big scary dream right now, you know, not just in North America, but you know, I have been invited to, this is what got rid of my imposter syndrome. You know, I was invited to speak at international symposiums in like, you know, Saudi Arabia and, and France, because they want to know what is it that you created and why did you create it? And then to have really intelligent people all over the world, like understand the concept. And, you know, it's, it's almost like you, it's that fake it till you make it. Like, I still need the, the good questions. I've not had a hard no for me mm -hmm. to stop, but I think my purpose has always been to help people. And now, right now, this time in my life, the chapter is to help people with chronic knee pain and knee replacement surgeries. And that's right. millions, millions and millions and millions of people all over you know, the world. And I will just take that one challenge right now and I will, I will do the best that I can. <laughs> well, I love it. And it's funny because uh, like you already talked about your dad and he's um, a helpful devil's advocate because he cares about you and it's father's day weekend and my dad has had both of his knees replaced and he needs uh he needs this as well so um all right so we're at the end of time but uh it's been great to talk with you and i appreciate all the passion and the energy and just the stick to itiveness the grit mm -hmm. that you have um and and just excited to see where where that'll take you and uh go knee and the organization and 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 just helping people. So tell us, give us, give us your parting wisdom. What's one book you would recommend to someone out there that they need to read? Okay. And I just want to say, this is a good recommendation because I have read a lot. I'm a big avid reader. I digest books on a regular basis, podcasts, you know, audiobooks, everything, but one that I, it has been pivotal in the last probably eight months. It's changed the trajectory of my company in terms of the marketing, the efforts, how I'm selling, how I'm marketing my, my product, the value proposition is by Alex Formosi, and it's called a um, hundred million dollar offers. And it, all it does is it pretty much says, if you're selling something, make it so um, desirable for the customer that it would be ridiculous for them to say no. So what I loved about it when I've, I've read it a bunch of times, but the first time I read it, it was like, oh, when people give me an objection, that means that's an objection I need to overcome. So when I do my sales pitch or my value proposition, I've already addressed that objection. And so, you know, it's almost like the book tells you to write down every objection that anyone has ever said about your product, write them all down, you know, because if you can address them all before they ever bring it up, then they have nothing to say, oh, you know, so it's really helped me figure out, um, I, I was selling features of my product, features, 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 and, you know, he made it sound like, you know what, they don't care about your features, don't care about the bells and whistles, it's what's in it for them, what's the benefit to them, and it just boils down to if you can create a million dollar offer to your customer where they only see wins, they're going to say, Yes. 
And so it's about figuring out how to do that. But it was an aha moment that, oh, people don't want to buy my product. Well, they're stupid. They should know how, how good it's going to be. No, no, no. What is it that they want? And what am I offering them for what they want? And it, it was just a, a complete paradigm shift for me. That's and, great. Um, yeah, I'm super excited applying those principles. Yeah, it's a good reframe because the truth is we all get stuck feeling sometimes like people are stupid um, and we just can't get stuck there for long. And so we reframe it realizing actually they're giving us really good feedback if we use it to, to shape whether it's a sales pitch or our business processes or what, whatever yeah. they are. Um, well, hey, it's been awesome to chat with you. Appreciate your time, Shella. And uh, to all of you out there listening, thanks for tuning in. Hope that um, you feel inspired by like Shella's passion is is uh, contagious a bit. So I hope it it charges you up to keep being passionate about uh, your purpose today and the purpose someday that you're not even aware of what it'll do uh, and how big it'll grow. So have a good have a good rest of your day. I don't know how to sign off. All right. Sounds good. Bye. Thanks.